Hey, what up, guys? It's Rob Monty here, bringing you guys some more wrestling news. All right, so first and foremost today, I'm just going to say I'm sorry, guys. I didn't put too much videos out this week. Um, basically, I've been busy with family, but that's fine. Um, basically, what's going on is just it's tax season and everything's just stressful in general. So with all, I'll, after all that, I think I should do some wrestling videos, provide you guys some content. And then maybe a little bit later on, work on some video gaming videos. So let's go on to talk about today's news. All right. So we're doing it old school style again. And we're just going to just kick it, you know. See what happen what's going on. By the way, folks, I want you guys' honest opinion. What did you guys think of Great American Bash? I mean, with the finish with Keith Lee winning the NXT Championship and the North American Championship. My honest opinion is I was I'm stoked, and uh, I love the respect um, angle that um, both Keith Lee and um, Adam Cole did. I mean that was a cool angle. Um, on top of that, you know I also loved what AEW had to offer last night. Um, my favorite match I guess from both shows would be. Honestly, I didn't think the Keith Lee and the um, and the Adam Cole match was gonna be that damn good compared to the Johnny Gargano and Isaiah Swerve match, but I really enjoyed that that main event last night, guys. So that's my favorite match on the Bash. As far as Fire Fest goes, I said I love. I'll tell you guys, my favorite match was in fact the Orange Cassidy and Chris Jericho match. I really enjoyed it, and I love the memes that are coming out of it. Oh man, it's just oh, my goodness. And then of course my favorite moment of I guess both shows, in general, if I had to say my favorite moment of each night it would be on the AEW's Fire Fest, which was when Taz presented the um, FTW. Uh, championship. Um, for those of you guys who don't know about the FTW Championship, Taz has basically reinstated the title and put it on Brian Cage. My honest opinion of this in general is I know he's doing it to help Brian get over, but in my opinion, Brian Cage, guys, <laughs> he doesn't need the damn FTW Championship. I mean, the fucker is badass already. And the reason why I say he's badass, I mean, look at the, look how big that fucker looks. He's like a gigantic sized Wolverine, for crying out loud. Let alone, let alone his in ring ability is far none one of the best out there. And especially for a guy his size, you know. A guy his size don't do the shit that he does. And I'm just saying, um, Brian Cage didn't need that FTW endorsement with the title but I can understand why Taz would do it and hey if it's about getting him over and I'm all for it it's just I don't think he needed it to be honest um, do I think he needs Taz if anybody is asking me on that uh, I think it's a good fit I mean when you look at Taz in general I mean Taz is a pretty fucking badass person to learn from especially if you're learning your promos better you should listen to what Taz has to say because he is definitely one of the best talkers from the 90s. And quite honestly, I think it made me laugh a little bit because when we saw that FTW title come out, I think I saw one of the fans in the chat say, Hopa, Taz is more over than, than Brian Cage. Taz is more over than Mox. He gets his own title. And I'm just like... He probably busted that out of the damn garage, man. He had all he had it hang hung up somewhere. And now he's just giving it to Brian Cage to help Brian Gage, you know. So, yeah. It's looked like we're starting to have some rain, guys. But, you know. What you call. When I look at Taz's thing, guys. I dropped my phone. Taz, you know. Is, um. <sighs> I think he's the best mouthpiece you can give Brian Cage. And in my opinion, if I were Taz right now and if I was AEW, I would push Brian Cage to be my Brock Lesnar. Because you look at WWE he's doing with Brock and Paul Heyman, I mean, you look at Brian Cage, he doesn't necessarily fit the typical indie wrestler mold. He actually fits more of what Vince McMahon has, 
which is the guy with the big body that can actually move, can wrestle, you know. To me, Brian Cage is a monster. So, in my opinion, if I were AEW right now, I would be trying to push him to the moon and make him my Brock Lesnar. Um, I feel bad for him, though, because of what happened in Impact, because they had him be, got beat by Tessa Blanchard, but that's a whole other story, and she's getting the shit out of her right now, but that's just what I feel like with Brian Cage. All right, getting that FTW championship anyway. By the way, it was kind of cool to see it come back, but I was like, ah, I don't think Brian Cage needs it, though. <laughs> That's just my own my honest opinion, guys. All right, so first and foremost, all right, there it is uh, backstage on it, actually, guys. We're going to read that. And both Rob Van Dam and Matt Seidel uh, comment on WWE's drug testing. Will be one, and then what else we got? Okay, we can look at what Am Cole says, and then Edge. Oh, that one's gonna be interesting. All right, what else? Oh, Fencer saying something. Cody Rhodes. All right. Okay, okay, that's, that's a, a big, big that's, that's a big article that we should go over. And let's go with this. Yeah. All right. And yeah, we'll end it here. All right. So first and foremost, we're gonna go back to Taz and Brian Cage. Uh, basically, as you guys can see, this is uh, the backstage news on why it was done, apparently. We have, in which PWI Insider has said, the belief amongst most wrestling fans was that ECW had owned the rights to the title, which WWE then purchased in 2001, and that Taz owns the rights and IP that has complete o sole ownership of the title. So, guys, the FTW belt is all Taz. <laughs> it's all Taz wrestling. <laughs> and you know what? I love Taz. I just love Taz. I mean, even when he's being a fucking badass or a dick, the dude is fucking awesome. You can't, you can't hate Taz. <sighs> so, And Brian Cage is even taking pictures with this belt. And doesn't he look like the damn Terminator or fucking Wolverine, man, with that fucking belt? I mean, just imagine, guys, in a week he could be wearing the AEW belt that looks like this. But you know what I'm also hoping in the in the regards of the, um, Brian Cage versus John Moxley match next week? Is that I'm hoping that when they do this, they have something similar to when Taz was trying to win the belt from Shane Douglas. As that would be really, that would be a nice contemporary and something new for the modern day audience. And. <laughs> just that fucking, Taz is gold, guys. Taz is gold. Look at that middle finger say I played. <laughs> and it's coming for you, Mox. All right. Yeah, so guys. I'm all for it, I guess, now. <laughs> but you want to know what pisses me off about this whole thing? Is that... Frickin' Taz says, Who better? Who better? You want my honest opinion about this? It just keeps reminding me of Chris Canyon. And God rest Chris Canyon, so... I think that was his catch line, not Taz. Taz is always... Survive! Fight me if you can! Survive! If I let you. And the fact that it says, who better? <laughs> I think Canyon will agree, will probably say, who better than Canyon? <laughs> so, I always look at that um, catchphrase connected to Canyon. But yeah, guys, fucking Brian Cage, man. He looks fucking beast with that belt. Maybe it'll work out. Maybe it will. All right. Right.
We're getting a lot of load time back. But we'll go right into Impact Wrestling now. As Impact Ring announcer Dave Penzer, David Penzer is saying, basically has come out and said something special is coming. And this is what he said. So back from my trip. What a blast. And the cat will get out of the bag soon. All I can say is something special and hilarious is coming your way. And I was honored to be a part of it. And I'm going to be like, oh, this is going to be fun. <laughs> I guess this was for Slammiversary, right? So I can't wait to see what they're going to do, guys. Um, I'm really enjoying Impact as of right now. Um, and the reason why I say I'm enjoying Impact a lot more is because I think they're doing a lot more stuff that is totally different from what AEW is doing and definitely different from WWE. Um, and, you know, it's the sad part is they had a ch such a shit, shit beginning, you know. I mean, they lost Tessa Blanchard. They lost Joey Ryan. They lost fucking Michael Elgin. I hope whatever is coming their way now, I hope it's something beautiful and puts Impact back on the map and smacks AEW in the face and tells WWE, we're coming for you! <laughs> All right, next. The Big Show recalls how he earned Undertaker's respect. Big Show had to say this. I had a hard, I had to fight really hard to earn Undertaker's respect because one quote one got to quote unquote sit under the learning tree. I didn't get free passes. I didn't get ex exceptions. I didn't get oh it's okay, don't worry about it. My ass got chewed out every single night. And the only thing I could do, I could try to do, was not make a mis the same mistake twice. He held me at a different level. That way I conducted myself out of the ring and the way I conducted myself in the locker room. He was just really instrumental in my career, shaping me into the talent and mentor I am now. I find myself a lot of find myself transferring a lot of the lessons I learned talent learn to the talent now. Just common sense and experience things that help them on their way. And then he goes on to say this. This is after he won the WWE championship. I remember working with Taker in France in a Coliseum that was built three hundred AD by the Romans. They had to use it for gladiator games. It was just a hospice during the plague. They used it as a fortress for, to defend themselves. This arena had so much history. I wrestled Taker that night, and we probably went close to 40, maybe 30, 43, 44 minutes. Mike Yoda was the referee, and he nearly had a heart attack that night because Taker and I wouldn't tell him the finish. Oh, man. <laughs> I would have a heart attack too because then I wouldn't know what the fuck I would be doing. We were getting dressed in the locker room and Kyoto comes. Oh no, okay guys. Okay, 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 okay. What's the finish? And Taker goes, I don't know. Show, what's the finish? I said, I don't know, boss. You're in charge, whatever you say, Taker said. Well, M Mike, we'll just see what happens out there. Kyoto's face was just a picture. <laughs> and then he goes and says, you know, the ref kind of needs to know the finish <laughs> but it was one of those things where if someone taps out that's the match if someone's shoulder gets pinned that's the match and that's the, uh, as much planning as Taker and I put into going into that match that night the way the acoustics were made in that stadium even though it was an outdoor with no roof, when they chanted Undertake, Undertaker, it's almost like you're in an ocean and you feel the waves push against you. You could feel that ring in that in the ring that from that energy and it was just one of those magic moments in my, for me in my career that I'll never ever forget. At the end of the night, after the match, when everything was done, I think I was I ended up tapping 
out to the Go Go Plata, the Hell's Gate, after he, after choke slams, and all kinds of crazy stuff that night. We toasted, and he said, "Good job, kid. You made it." And that was for me, for my crowning moment. I made journeyman that night. I was no longer an apprentice. I became a journeyman. It's pretty a big deal, and it was pretty emotional for me. I'll be honest. I worked for so many years and so hard to get the nod, that nod. I think it, I drove him nuts for the next couple of days because I was so appreciative of of it. Oh man. You guys want my honest opinion about that? About um what Big Show is saying here is this. It took that match in the Roman Coliseum for him to earn Undertaker's respect because he made the match. He, he and you know what? I would have loved to have seen this match. I mean in a Roman Coliseum I would have loved to see this match. I'm a fan. Guys, I'm a fan of history myself. I love ancient history. I love ancient Rome. To see Undertaker and Big Show fight in the Roman Coliseum? Holy shit, guys. I would have fucking enjoyed that so freaking much. I, and the way it sounds like that it was like a really, really good match. Oh, man. I don't know, guys. I think I'm really tempted to watch this. I hope... I hope WWE catches win catches win of this particular interview that Big Show had, and they put it on the WWE Network if they have footage, because I would love to see it. Oh man! All right. So as you guys know, COVID nineteen is a big thing going on in WWE and the world of professional wrestling right now. Unfortunately, I have to report the uh, the unfortunate passing of Conan's mother, which was apparently due to COVID nineteen. As the Wrestling Observer has has reported, Conan's mother ha has passed away after being diagnosed with co the coronavirus. Per the report, Conan told him the tragic news. He didn't reveal the news publicly and is only telling those close to him at this time. And then here's another thing too, guys. Um, not only has Conan's mother passed away, from for coronavirus, Lana's mother and father have both tested for tested positive. It's this is like oh my god. And Lana wrote, "My dad tested positive for COVID. Please keep my family's in my family in your prayers." And then my parents never go outside, so this is just mind blowing. Possibly. Like, I guess what you guys are like looking at me and you're like thinking, why am I going like that? Um, Lana's parents have tested positive for COVID. Um, quite honestly, they're both in ICU. And you know what? I wish them the best and speediest of recoveries and keeping them in their prayers and front pots. I hope... It had nothing to do with the fact that Lana was, in fact, at tapings when they had the COVID-19 testing where 30 members of the WWE staff, whether your talent or crew, were practically infected. And I hope it, I hope it, I hope she's not infected either, you know. I just hope, Lana, I hope you're healthy. I'm just saying, like, the fact that this has come out, I hope it, you are healthy and if you did come in contact with your folks, I hope it wasn't like that, you know. My hearts and condolences and thoughts are with you, Lana, and your mother and your father. My thoughts are also out there for Conan and his mother as they pass on. And, guys, I'm going to make this very clear right now. If you are... Um, worried about what it's going to be like in this new world with COVID-19 being um, a disease going around, I'm going to just say this. Wash your hands. Follow the CDC's 
guidelines and wear your mask if you can, you know? Don't be an idiot. Don't be like Loki who thinks he's doing this for the good of people. If you ask me, we got to take this um, virus seriously. I do agree with President Trump. Yes, a bunch of us do need to go back to work. And a bunch of us do need to go back to school. But we need to find a way that it is practical and being... What I'm saying is don't lose common sense. You know this thing is going around. People are catching it. People are dying from it. Um, come on, guys. Let's protect one another. Wear your mask. Wash your hands. Carry hand sanitizer with you. Uh, carry wipes. You know, do do what you gotta do to make sure that you can prevent this disease. Cause this disease is in fact serious. Um, you know, and I've never heard the president in the United States say, "Oh." You don't have to follow CDC's guidelines, which is beyond the case. He's he's suggesting that we continue to practice social distancing and practice our our sanitary practices, such as washing hands clean, wearing a mask, less touching of the face. You know. So what I'm saying is, guys, don't be an idiot. Protect yourself from the virus and protect others. The more we do so, the more we get out of this shit. Or else we're all going to end up like Florida, uh, somewhere in Wuhan, and probably in New York and California and Texas right now where they're having the major outbreaks. So what I'm saying is just fucking use common sense. Protect the people that you love. Protect yourself. And don't be like low-key because I don't think low-key was thinking when he was actually doing this. He... And the fact is, he thinks he just because he has a good body, he's going to be stronger to this virus. Um, I've actually saw an article where the virus has actually caused long-term term damage to one's body. And if you don't believe me, I recommend you guys go check out the article. I mean, I saw a lot of things. Like, people's lungs are really fucked up. So, I would really... I really encourage people to really, really, and I stress it out, wash your hands, wear your mask, don't touch your face if your hands are dirty. And don't touch other people's face, <laughs> too, if your hands are dirty. Wear gloves at the gas pump, fuck. <laughs> Let's stop this damn spread and just get over with it already. I don't want to be getting sick, or anybody getting sick for that matter. Alright, enough of my COVID-19 soapbox. All right, Linda McMahon's mother has passed away, unfortunately, as well. Um, she died at the age of 93, and she went peacefully. And this is what Stephanie McMahon wrote out today. And she said, Last week, my 93-year-old grandmother passed peacefully, surrounded by the people who love her. One of the last things she said to me was, Let there be love. Love is what heals us all. To anyone who is hurting or struggling, I send my love to you. Rest in peace, Mima. Thank you for everything. I gotta say, I gotta say, for an old lady, my God, she was beautiful. Uh, <laughs> we're not gonna go into that, but yeah, yeah, man, wow. So sorry. I'm sorry to the McMahon family. You guys are also in my thoughts and prayers. And, you know, hopefully everything will look better for everything for the wrestling business, your guys' family, and, you know, just grow strong, you know. And I'm pretty sure your, I'm pretty sure Stephanie, your Mima, will be watching you. And watching and be proud of the success that you guys do. Ah, oh, man. It's such a sad week, guys. All right. And now, to finish off the COVID-19 thing, Renee Young sends a reminder to the fans. See, if, if I'm not the only one sending it, Renee Young has said it. And this is what she had to say. Just a little friendly reminder. Wearing a mask can literally be saving yours or someone else's life. As someone that had that's had COVID, trust me, 
You don't want it. Be safe. Take care of each other. And I'm going to say this. Renee Young is probably look like healthy as a horse. For crying out loud. And if she says this is... Uh, I like to stand by her and with what she said. Because if she says it's something that you don't want, you probably don't want it. Oh, man. And I could understand that. I mean, she's have to distance herself from her husband, Mox, you know, and that's not, that's not fun at all. You know, that's actually sad. All right. Next up on the news. Ring of Honor star will no longer be with the company. By the way, guys, before we go into it, uh, Ring of Honor has also posted up a Hannah Kimura tribute. Uh, I think you guys should check it out. I actually watched it earlier. It was pretty, pretty good. And makes me it makes me even more sad that we lost her. But anyway, going into Ring of Honor news. Ring of Honor star Leon St. Giovanni LSG is no longer with the company and is officially a free agent. Now let this be known. LSG has kept a good relationship with Ring of Honor in the meantime. And Quite honestly, they could bring him back at any time, really. It's just a matter of what is in future for LSG. I think LSG would be great to bring to Impact. I mean, a very underrated wrestler can be very useful to them, you know. Um, as far as AEW, if they wanted to make their own star, they could use him too. So, could he end up going to NXT or New Japan? I think so. When you're in, when you leave Ring of Honor and you're on good terms with the wrestling business, like like um LC, LSG, the sky's the limit. It's just a matter of who, where you, where will you make it, or where will you land, you know. So I think if he um if he does try out for WWE, they might take him for the NXT, or or even Two Five Live. If he goes to New Japan, they'll probably take him. You know, it's more likely you're gonna get hired for New Japan than you do WWE. And as far as Impact goes, Impact is always looking to make their own stars right now. And AEW, hey, you never know. Alright, so, speaking of AEW, Cody is interested in facing Eddie Kingston for the TNT Championship. And this is what was said. A fan by the name of Alejandro Cruz says, follow-up question, if you do accept, because I know you're not going to tell me, if you do accept, can you please sign Eddie Kingston to AEW after the match? Because he's one of the best promo guys in wrestling today. Yeah. Cody responded is, is he? I'll say this. Arn, TK, Real, Marshall, and Marshall won. Help pinpoint challengers for the open challenge. And against the wishes of those not wanting to reward folks going into the business for themselves. I am considering him. And the other one who rules my mention, stay tuned. So, from right there, there is a match in interest for, for a match between Cody and Eddie Kingston. The only thing about it is, I know Alejandro Cruz has asked if he could be signed to AEW. In my opinion, it's like, all right, they sign him. What if they can't use him? What if they don't have any good plans? Or what if they don't? What if he doesn't fit their image in general? So, be right back, guys. So anyway, guys, um, Cody, he is going to um, 
basically just, you know, he wants to face Eddie Kingston. He's not sure of signing him to AEW. And like I said, if they can't use him or they don't see what they can do with him, they're not probably not going to sign him. But if they know he can do it and earn a contract, like how, um, what was his name? Like how the last one did, you know. He, he, what I'm saying is, if he doesn't impress them or even gives them the chance of seeing what they can do, it might not be a possibility. But if he does great and does great numbers for that audience, they'll probably sign him. It's just a matter of what's the what is what's in it, in it what's in it for AEW and what can he provide? What can Eddie Kingston provide for AEW after facing Cody, you know? And quite honestly, I think Cody's interested because if he already put him up there with him and the other one, then, you know, hey, that's a good sign. That's a good news, you know? All right. So Edge comments on his real-life affair with Lita. And this is what was said. On how close he and Matt were, Edge and Christian and the Hardys were great buddies. We would go to Outback after and grab a bite to eat. And spitball ideas for the matches and all those things. We didn't ride together. It was never that. It was always me, Jay, or me and Lance. But we were obviously close because we made our mark together. So when you do that, you share something that you only share with them. And you throw the Dudleys into that mix. And we will, will always... Share experience together. After everything went down, I realized, okay, oh gosh, how did I find myself here? And what did I do? Now I got to face up to him. And now this is what ha what he goes on to say this. He says on how Matt took it a bad situation and they found positives in it. You got to be pros and also back to my my point of finding positives when it doesn't seem like there are any on the surface you gotta dig underneath the surface this was one of those and you go okay we're here now what did we do let's try to make some money together and let's try to further our both of our careers out of this and hopefully out of this we can not only be stronger performers but stronger people too and that usually doesn't happen within the context of a wrestling storyline. So it's a little bit more because of that. And I think that's also maybe the first instance of people going, Oh, wait, there is reality in this too. And that's why it's remembered. And I think in terms of us kind of splitting off from ENC and the Hardys respectively, I think that's that one was what set everything in motion going forward and for Lita as well because that flipped her entire career uh, it flipped her entire character on its head and she was able to adapt and take it and run with it when you, if you had said two years earlier probably the most popular female in the industry could end up being the most despised that's not possible on his relationship with, was with Jeff through his issues with Matt. We went through a period, as I think any brother who would support his brother, but then we came out of it on the backside, and I think we all realized we ended up in a better places anyway, and we all grew from it. It was just a lousy way to do it, but that's all you can do. That's life. And you know what? I agree with Edge. That's life, guys. I mean, sometimes you get put in situations that you're not happy about or you can, you're can you not comfortable about. But eventually you should want to come out being a bigger and better person. And instead of always holding on to the cons, you want to go for the pros and get for the positives. So I'm glad for Edge and Matt were able to do that, you know. And it was actually a great rivalry. I actually enjoyed it. And quite honestly, I think it made Edge a bigger star than he already was. 
I think Matt Hardy wouldn't be as big a star if it wasn't for that. Because I believe if... Here, here's the truth when I look at Matt Hardy's career at that time. Even though Matt was still with WWE and Jeff had gone on to TNA at this point in time the, during their first run, Matt never really got over as big as Jeff did. And then... And then... The whole thing with um, Edge and Lita happened. And basically, Matt became a bigger star because now you have a reason to be cheered and be sympathized with. You know? It just made Matt into a bigger star than he ever would have been and launched his career into mainstream popularity, in my opinion. As far as... Um, as far as the whole thing with Jeff, I can understand. And you know what? I think I think that's just how it is. When you're a brother and you see somebody dating your brother's um, ex, I mean, you just kind of get really pissed off and you get defensive because you don't want to see your brother hurt. And I'm kind of glad that they all worked it out, you know. And, you know, it's just... They're all bigger stars. I mean, when you think about it... Matt's up doing the greatest shit that he's doing right now in his career. And it, that doesn't matter if it was in Impact. Didn't matter if it was in Ring of Honor. Didn't matter if it was WWE. Didn't matter if it was AEW. He's actually doing a lot of big stuff that's making him into a bigger, bigger star as we speak. As far as Edge goes, Edge is probably one of the greatest of all time. When I look at Jeff, Jeff Hardy is probably the greatest person out of this. I think he's the biggest mainstream player out of all those guys, just because of how much fans loved him. I mean, I couldn't go anywhere in school when and talk about WWE with friends and no one bring up Jeff Hardy. Everybody brought up Jeff Hardy. Everybody was in love with Jeff Hardy. Hell, guys, one of my ex-love interests in my life loved Jeff Hardy so much she melted when he hugged her. It's just, that's just how it was, you know? And then on top of that, um... You look at Christian. Christian's probably the most underrated wrestler, but, you know, he's probably the greatest underrated wrestler for what he has done in his career. So you guys ask me, you know, all those guys became big stars after their rivalry, after the Lita thing, after, you know, after all of it. They're all big stars. And I enjoy each and every one of their, um, their, their segments. They were all great and entertaining. All right, so next... All right, we're about closing up here, closing up shop. Adam Cole went on and talked about how Kevin Owens helped him in his career. And Cole goes on to back to war games. Well, you know, it broke my heart because everyone knows that me and Kevin are good buddies. And I think, I thought, of course, the first time that me and Kevin are going to get to be together in WWE, of course, well, be a team. We'll be a team. Of course, we're going to fight side by side. And instead, he tries to show up at war, to war games to beat the crap out of me. So I'm still a little better, a little bitter about Kevin Owens coming out and trying to ruin my fun. And then asked how Kevin helped him on um, in the independence. In all seriousness, Kevin Owens is another guy. I briefly touched on this, but he played such a big part of m in me and kind of taking off in the independence. Kevin was the was a guy that looked kind of looked, took me under his wing in PWG, which later helped me out at Ring of Honor. He was a big, big aspect to me, kind of understanding the independent or just in general the main event style and how to kind of perform and what to do and what to say. He'll never, ever take credit for it because that's just the type of guy he is. But I always credit him as someone who really did help me. And he's a great friend, except for that War Games thing. <laughs> Made me angry. <laughs> oh, man. You know what? I'm, I agree with Adam Cole because Kevin Owens was definitely a big person in um, Adam Cole's career. I mean, they did a lot of stuff in the Independence together. And they were always great together, very entertaining, you know. 
And you know what? I think it's just because when you look at Kevin Owens as a wrestler that helps other wrestlers, especially being a journeyman himself, he he likes to help guys. He wants them to succeed. He wants them to do so. So if he takes you under your wing, you know he's going to be all in for you. And then on top of that, there's other people I noticed that Kevin Owens always helped out with. For one, Jay Briscoe is one of those guys. I mean, Jay, you know, he finally got his moment when he beat Kevin, and Kevin was honored to give him that opportunity, you know. And Kevin even was the one that talked into Jay into relinquishing the belt when Jay got injured. And, you know, I think as far as a lot of people's careers in um, Ring of Honor, Kevin Owens is very instrumental, and he's always been a good guy to a lot of people. Even when you see him outside of wrestling and he talks personal life stuff, like real life shit that he's going through or going with people, he's a genuinely good human being, you know. And he'll tell you straight up, he's not going to bullshit you. So, you know, Kevin Owens, guys, is probably... Kevin Owens is probably one of the only guys I notice that are out there that I, I would probably respect if I were to join the business right now. And it's because of the fact that he keeps business and real life separate. He keeps his personal life and professional life separate, it, separated to the point where he can tell you when he's being him, when he's just being normal good guy that he is. And also the real guy that he is. I and mean, you could tell when he's in character, you know. I mean, he's just, I just say this. Kevin Owens is probably going to be one of the, probably going to be one of those guys that a lot of people are going to talk about in the locker room for years to come as somebody that is really respected. So, that's how I looked at it, look at it. And I think a lot of people can learn from Kevin. I think even Jim Cornette could, but Cornette will never admit it. But that's why he's the cuck of Cornette. All right, last thing on the news today. Rob Van Dam and Matt Seidel. Oh, my God, they're going to start the lawnmower. Anyway, RVD, Evan Bourne on WWE's drug testing policy and smoking pot. So, RVD, we're going to go goes like this. I just, it says this, the aspect of the 420 sign in ECW. I just immediately identified with it. I thought, well, I would love to be the poster boy for weed because I love weed that much. RVD on Stephanie McMahon talking to him about smoking pot while in WWE. She said, look, if you're going to get high, at least be discreet about it. <laughs> oh, man. Hearing Stephanie McMahon say that makes me tear up a little bit, guys, but... <laughs> you know she probably had to have done some of it herself, but he, um... You didn't hear RVD to get told that? Oh, that's funny. <laughs> oh, man. And then RVD on losing his titles and being suspended after being arrested for possession of 18 grams of pot. No trial, no nothing. It was way better before I got busted. When I came back, ECW was on going downhill f fast, so it's ultimate destruction. I kind of agree with that because the moment he got arrested and Sabu got arrested for the, for the pot, oh man, I think, um, yeah, that was definitely the downfall of the ECW, WWE, or WWE, ECW, just because, you know, Rob was supposed to be the poster boy for um, the ECW. He was supposed to be the guy to lead the ECW, the new ECW, into the next generation and basically pass it over to the next generation. And I think that's what st started the downfall because they talked about Rob actually having the belt a little longer than what he did, you know, guys? So I can understand. Um, I, can, I can agree with what he was saying there. Uh, is it his fault, though, to why ECW sucked? No, it's just that WWE, ECW um, wasn't the same ECW. That's just how it is. It wasn't the same. And here's the thing. The one thing about it is 
I mean, everybody's going to complain about how WWE want, and Vince McMahon wanted to um, change ECW to what it was. But the thing is, from what I understand, from all of the backstory about it, was that Paul Heyman actually wanted it to be very similar to the original ECW. And basically try to make stars like he did before in ECW. Whereas Vince, he wanted to make this ECW a little bit, a brand new ECW, a different ECW. Something that was more extreme than what it was. And that was, you know, it was basically going to become another extreme version of WWE, but a progressing and more working ECW. And it could have worked in that sense, but him and Paul Heyman could never come together and make a good ECW thing. And the fact is, it's just, I think when it comes down to it, from what it sounded like, Vince wanted to make ECW evolve into something of a newer ECW, a newer version of ECW. Probably like what NXT is today. Um, but, like, Paul Heyman, guys, he... I don't want to say this because I don't want people are going to say I'm wrong, but from what it sounded like to me is that he wanted to keep ECW the same way he had it all those years ago. Whereas, and basically it was stuck in the past where Vince was like, let's move on to the future. <laughs> what would you done for your future kind of thing? And the only thing, real thing Paul Heyman did for the real future at that time was CM Punk. You know? That's that's the scary part about it. Um, I'm I'm not I'm saying this from my source, which would be a third source or fourth source. You know, it's not. But what I'm saying is not gold. But from what I understand from all the shoot interviews and what they talked about, it sounded like Vince wanted to move to the future. Heyman was stuck in the past. That's what it sounded like. Anyway, so Evan Bourne goes on to say this. And yes, I know it says Seidel. Matt Seidel and Evan Bourne are the same person, people. So this is what he said. Known pot smokers being tested more often. And he says, right away in my developmental stage at WWE, it, will, it sort of became an issue of me having to play the game. Can I smoke today or am I worried about getting the test? And then he goes on to talk about wrist fail drug tests to treat pain. And he says, the consequences were extremely steep. The psychological consequences were even harder. The failed drug test hurt my self-confidence because failure, a failure implied that I was a person with a bad moral character. And it ostracized for smoking pot. I felt like I was almost ostracized. And persecuted for my personal choices after each failed test. I felt more like a failure. And I had no clue how to handle the shame. So, let me tell you guys this. Rob Van Dam's experience with smoking weed in WWE. That was just Rob Van Dam living his life. <laughs> and for poor Matt Seidel, I mean, he had a very negative, negative outlook for smoking weed. Um, could I see that being possible? Well, yeah, because you're part of a publicly traded company and they don't want to be seen like a person that advertises drugs. That's how I see it as, guys. All right, so what do I think about marijuana and wrestling? If you're doing it because you're trying to relax and recover your strength, you know, and recover, you know, just, you know, just to relax from the pain and all that, Hey, I'm all good for it. I mean, if that's what you can do, as long as you have a green card or you live somewhere where it's legal, I, I totally get it. That's that's what you're doing. Other than that, I do not advocate illegal marijuana sales. I do not advocate marijuana in general. But if you have to take it because it's helping you medically or it's helping you to relax when you need to relax, hey, cheers to you. You know? Um... I know I'm not I'm not a pot smoker at all. I actually might be a pot eater because I ate pot when I was younger, but that's not me now. And I don't necessarily like being around people who smoke pot because I get headaches 
once in a while from the smoke, from the secondhand smoke. I really get real bad headaches, guys. I'm not lying about that. But I'm not against people smoking weed. I mean, fuck. If you're, to me, smoking weed is the least harming drug out there. So I'm not against it. I'm not. If anything, I just keep my distances when I know people are full on gone, you know. And I try to relax more. Maybe get a beer while that's happening going on too, you know. Other than that, I don't advocate pot in illegal terms. Such as selling a marijuana, buying marijuana illegally, you know. I'm not, I'm not cool for it. And as far as what I would like to see what people do with marijuana is, I hope people do more um, industrial things, such as building, making wood out of marijuana, making strong materials such as fabric, like clothes, you know, that kind of stuff. And oils, medical oils and all that kind of stuff. I mean, there's a lot of good things you can do with marijuana, too. That's just my honest opinion. So, I don't advocate it in legal terms, but in legal terms and industrial terms, yes, I do. So, that will be it for today, guys. What do you guys think? Should marijuana be allowed in wrestling for wrestlers? Should it be off the WWE drug testing policy? Let, let me know what you guys think. All right. Hit a like, subscribe, enjoy. The, enjoy other videos on the channel. And, you know, I hope you have a great day, guys. God bless y'all. Thank y'all for watching. Love y'all. Aloha.